Warning. This story contains graphic scenes and scenarios which may be disturbing, specifically scenes involving an infant. Listen at your own risk. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Part 1. On the killing fields between a pillow and a head. By midwinter, the war was already lost. The soldiers mustered rank and file, thin and slouched. For all their brave victories, they had suffered a defeat of morale. None of them had expected the war to rage quite so long, nor to drag as it had in the quiet between the screams of battle, where a failing breath during the night was as devastating as any other grievous bodily wound. Lieutenant Namus should have been a captain by now. Captain Casco had fallen three nights prior, but the fighting hadn't ebbed long enough for an official change in command. If Namus would have stopped for his moment of self-congratulatory pomp, it would have been for his honor alone, and likely soured the men against him. He couldn't appear so callous, so he remained a lieutenant to no one but death. Such was their endless struggle, the thing that now seemed pointless and surreal an automatic routine of brutality for brutality's sake, injuring one and all to the smell of blood and the slippery feel of aging entrails underfoot. Victory was now couched in the rush of novelty, of new violence that could be mistaken for creativity, art, to a minds that knew only pain. On this particular day, the soldiers mustered again, and Lieutenant Namus walked the line, and a trusted girl from a nearby village screamed to be released. She spoke the language of the enemy, and that had been enough. Now she begged in her bastard tongue. Namus couldn't speak it himself. He had relied on Captain Casco for things like that. But he knew a few words from repetition alone. Esca mula de lime. Please, have mercy. The soldiers were slouching, thin, Starved for victory. Namus owed it to them, and the girl would provide. I was too distracted to enjoy my meal. The tater tots were fine, I'm sure. That Rachel's aioli was probably excellent. I had made the burgers and knew exactly what to expect from them. Sautéed shiitake mushrooms, melted double cream brie, lean beef, arugula, a lemon-zested bernays, and a lightly toasted brioche bun. Sweet and bright and nutty and fatty, all in perfect balance that was perfectly lost on me. I had stolen the recipe from a restaurant that we used to love. The first time we went, I had ordered the burger, and Rachel had ordered something less memorable, and halfway through, we switched plates. Within a month, the waitstaff knew what she'd ordered ahead of time. And then we had Eddie, and going out became a rarity. During the first few years, my making her favorite burger at home would have made her wet. If Eddie was down for the night, we would have made love quietly, giggling and hushing and biting pillows like we were the kids, and Eddie was a tenuously sleeping parent just down the hall. Now, the burger smelled the same, tasted the same, but Rachel seemed lost in a staring contest with her wine glass as I watched Eddie with an uneasy knot in my stomach. You didn't cook this right, Paul. It had been Dad once, and Eddie was far too young to be such a shit. It's white bread, cheddar, and a patty, Eddie. I made it how you- No, you made it gray. It's not supposed to be gray. Rachel shuddered, as she always did when Eddie went from a simmer to a boil. Cooper's face twisted into distress as his plastic spoon clattered against the tray of his high chair. A moment later, he was wailing, and Rachel looked wedged between despondency and tears. Stop fucking crying, pooper! Wah! Eddie, enough! Wah! Wah! Rachel didn't look anywhere in particular as she addressed the table. She didn't make any real efforts to be hurt. I... I can't. I'm sorry, honey, but... She stood, lifted Cooper into her arms, and in a movement that seemed more reflexive than thought out, reached for her wine glass. Her fingers were inches away from the stem as Eddie's hand darted across the table and swiped it onto its side. The wine spilled, the glass shattered, 
and Rachel deflated even more. Her eyes welled, and Eddie stared at his mother, my loving wife, with complete indifference. I'm not cleaning that up, Mommy. Flat. Rachel left crying, and I felt hollow, and the untended wine dribbled off the table to join a dozen other stains on the carpet that Rachel and I had chosen together. Then, I watched as Eddie separated his burger into ragged halves. He dragged one through the puddle on the table, held it up, and watched the red wine drip from his meat and cheese and bread. Smiled. I'm full, Paul. Namus and I are gonna go and play. He lifted his toy leopard by the head and left me alone at a table with three uneaten meals. I was too tired to fight, too tired to insist, so I gathered the broken glass for the trash can and mopped up the wine and thought of how the meals would taste if things were different. Every parent feels guilty, Paul. It doesn't mean we've done anything wrong, but you know as well as I that children don't come with an instruction book. Dr. Foster had a tone for public radio, a sleepy English drawl that might have been calculated to soothe. Rachel liked him. She said that, one day, he just might say something useful, that all of his advice seems pragmatic. But I saw him cynically, as the purveyor of a dream. I know why I feel guilty, Doc, and I know I haven't done anything wrong, but every blog and podcast says that I have. Do they? They don't tell children to change themselves. I'm the one with the responsibility to do something different, so of course it's my fault when Eddie does something. Oh, Jesus Christ, you know what? Just tell me how to feel nothing. Can you do that? Why don't you tell me about something specific that you're having a problem with, and we can work on that. He smiled pleasantly, eyes patiently receptive. I loathe the man at times like this. He pissed on his brother two days ago. Rachel had just changed Cooper, and Eddie waited for the first opportunity and pissed on him. Let's work on that, Doc. Go ahead. Rachel squeezed my arm. I was being combative. I knew that. But I was annoyed. I was always annoyed. But I hadn't always been annoyed. The thought made me sulk, which might have been functionally as good as being cowed into a participatory mood. Rachel, how did you feel when Eddie did that? Small? Huh. And Paul, do you think Eddie might have been feeling small as well? No. I don't know. Dr. Foster steepled his fingers and nodded as though doing an impression of a therapist. It was punchably theatrical, and for the next ten minutes I all but checked out. He knew Eddie like his teachers did. A pleasant child, talkative and polite and inquisitive. Eddie always commented on differences in the office or in Dr. Foster's appearance. I like the pattern on your socks, Dr. Foster. Are those new flowers in the fronts, Dr. Foster? They're very beautiful. Dr. Foster probably thought we were crazy. Sometimes I wondered it myself. Until next time. Remember your homework, try to be pleasant, work together, all of you, when you're caring for Cooper. If Eddie feels included, he won't feel unattended. And keep journaling. Sometimes writing your feelings down is enough to assess them objectively. I know it's helping Eddie, but it's not just for him. There was no rape in war, just as there was no murder. Lieutenant Namus knew that fact, but it did nothing to make the screams less grating. The screams somehow persisted as something to nag at the ears, even when the sight of blood became rote. The enemy scout had bled plenty as the men had pulled him down onto the pike, but the blood no longer bothered Namus. The way the man flailed and then squirmed and then twitched didn't bother him either. Piked or cut down in battle, most men died the same. There was pain, then shock, then stillness. The process was one governed by biology, but
but the screams were individual, born by psychology. They lacked the sameness that death did. The girl had screamed. So had infantryman Cuddlebunny, after he had deigned to question Namus's humanity. If anything, Namus had more humanity than most. He fought to protect something important, and he did it valiantly. And he was a leopard, decidedly inhuman and yet bound to human ideals. Glory, victory, legacy. The screams were human, though. Disparate as his enemy. Born by a psychology of weakness. But Namus was strong. Too strong to be so affected by something as ever-present as a scream. And if violence could be art, why couldn't screams be music? Desperation and fear and agony all weaved together into something melodic. Sergeant Bluey had reported the capture of two enemies that morning, useless as prisoners, but as instruments. Namus felt like humming for the first time since the war had begun. He trotted past an orderly row of pikes, his old gallery of sloughing flesh and heavy bones. It wasn't far to Pillow Nook where the prisoners were kept, but pillows were soft, and at this moment, what Namus desired most was a hard place with pleasant acoustics. I hear you, Paul, but look at him now. Maybe we are crazy. Can two people be crazy about the same thing? Fuck, maybe we have, I don't know, a gas leak in the house or something. Rachel's left leg bounced incessantly, hooked over her right. She bit at her fingernail, oblivious to the chips she was leaving in her nail polish. And Eddie was laughing with another little girl he'd just met. The other parents at the playground seemed blissfully aloof or lovingly watchful. Soft hands rest to assist in a tumble, fast thumbs pecking away at phone screens. I wondered if any of their children were monsters too. I don't think we have a gas leak, Rach. He's just clever and manipulative and... I don't know. He's not a sociopath. No, he's he's not. He's a kid, right? I don't know. I don't think kids can be sociopaths. Or at least they can't be diagnosed as... Hey, buddy. Leave your friend Sock alone, okay? Eddie was following the girl up the ladder of the jungle gym and pinching the back of her socks. He stopped when I called to him, smiled, waved. The girl didn't seem bothered. Why was I? What if we're overly sensitive? Maybe he's just a dick and he's fine. Don't call him a dick in public, Paul. People will say things. Let him. Rachel sighed. God, I could use a cigarette. And there's a mom over there. If I could ask and she'd bum me one. I chuckled. People say things. Fuck him. I'm going over. Watch Cooper. Thanks for not judging me. She was fifteen feet away before I could think to respond. Then she was huddled next to the smoking mom, guarding the end of her cigarettes with a hand as the mom lit it. The way mothers spoke upon meeting at the playground always looked like flirting to me. A part of me was more envious of that than Rachel's nicotine fix. Maybe I could flirt with a dad and get a beer. I chuckled at the notion, pushing Cooper's stroller back and forth absently as he slept. Felt strangely okay. Then I returned my attention to the jungle gym. The little girl I saw immediately, in her violently yellow dress. Eddie was wearing something drab, blue, maybe. I couldn't remember. The girl was meandering near the squat wooden castle, then sat between the jungle gym and the swings. She seemed almost grumpy. Perhaps Eddie had left her for a new friend. I searched for him along the taggers and ball kickers. Where was he? Smoking mom had lit another cigarette and was happily chatting with Rachel. The girl was climbing the ladder of the jungle gym again, followed by a smiling boy who wasn't picking at her socks. And Eddie was... Where? Fuck. I began to stand and... Hi, Dad. Paul at home. Dad on the playground. I recognized his voice. Searched for its source. Eddie. Over here. 
I squinted at the castle, at the thin mock arrow slit window on my side of it, at the thin sliver of Eddie's face, one eye watching me in the curl of a smirk. My heart was racing a bit. Foolish. He was just being a child like the rest. Ten more minutes, Eddie. Okay? Okay, Paul. Back to Paul. He darted out of the castle and toward the jungle gym, made for the higher ladder to the slide. The little girl stood at the top. Was she crying? Paul, come over here for a second. I turned my attention. Rachel beckoned me as smoking mom now held a phone in her hand and Rachel reached for hers. Maybe Rachel had made a friend too. The woman looked hip, like she might be fun. On my way. I stood, glanced back over at the jungle gym. A crumple of violent yellow and skinny limbs lay at the bottom of the ladder. Eddie stood at the top, alone. He stared at me for a moment, his face emotionless, more jarring than a smirk. He peered downward, and then stepped off the side into open air. Above the sound of his scream, I almost didn't hear the crack as he landed on the little girl below. Oh my god, Eddie! Rachel ran. Smoking mom and a half dozen other parents followed. Most tried unhelpfully to make sense of it. Did anyone see what happened? No, I was watching my son Theo. Did they fall? Is she okay? The ladder's too high, I've said it a dozen times. But what happened? Does anyone know? A crowd of parents shrugged bashfully, guiltily. None of them had seen what I had. They tended to the children, mine and someone else's. Eddie wailed. The ambulance that came wailed too. A stand-in for the silent little girl in the violent yellow dress. She said she would tell. Namus wouldn't like that. And Namus is a god. He is strong. He is a protector. A leader. Tell him what happened, Eddie. Paul, I really think we should let him get to it on his own. Respectfully, Doc, I don't. Tell him. Eddie's arm was in a bright blue cast. He dislocated his elbow. The girl had nearly died. She had a punctured lung from two broken ribs, but her ruptured spleen had been worse. She'd have scars now, and it was Eddie's fault, so it felt like mine. I saw you. I'm done protecting you. Now tell him, Edward. Now. I... I, I fell. I'm sorry for being clumsy, Dad. You're right. I, I'm... I'm a fairy. I don't want to be, I swear. There are times when indignation feels like rage. Looks like rage. My face burned, and I knew how I must have looked. But I'd never once called my son a fairy. I never called him clumsy. Dr. Foster looked predictably concerned all the same. Are you fucking kidding me, Eddie? The doc, he's... Sorry, Dad. I... I forgot, um, I fell, and my dad wasn't even there. My dad and mommy loved me, and um, they would never... It was a damn good act, his eyes brimming with tears, his posture tense and guarded, his gaze pleading with me for an answer to the concocted question. It was a fucking masterful act. A tearful, shaking weapon leveled at me. Dr. Foster's concern had morphed into something accusatory. I saw him inching toward Eddie. A subtle, defensive movement. I hadn't done anything. Where the fuck had Eddie gotten all of this? The maliciousness, the manipulation. He was a child working a room full of grown men. I found myself feeling miserably alone wanting my wife to defend me against my nine-year-old son. But I hadn't wanted to gang up on Eddie. I had to protect him, even as he'd sat in our living room, staring darkly, silently, as I'd screamed about the girl. I'd like to speak to your son alone, Paul. This is fucking ridiculous. If it is, then I'd like to hear it from Eddie. He knows the difference between the truth and a lie. Don't you, Eddie? Yes, sir. 
Dr. Foster. I don't think he does. Or he does, but he doesn't care. I'm worried that he might be a sociopath. I know that you can't, or he's too young, or... He wasn't listening. He'd already made up his mind about me. I was angry. An abuser. A man deserving of his contempt. And my truth was a poor substitute for Eddie's lies. Foster clicked his pen pointedly. Paul, I really don't want to involve the authorities unnecessarily. They've already been involved, Doc. I did nothing wrong. I'm not abusing my son or whatever it is you think. And I sure as hell didn't break his arm. Paul, I'm not saying you did. I'd just like to hear Eddie's story without influence. Oh, this is fucking insane. But sure, be my guest. Talk. Jesus fucking Christ. I was heaving venom by the time I got into the hall. I couldn't sit. I wanted to scream, to punch a wall and be the bad man they were probably gossiping about. I checked my phone out of habit. One message from Rachel. How's it going? My mind was a non-verbal clot of helpless fury. I didn't have words for her or anyone else. And my anger and my fear and my frustration were all about my son, my little boy. All of a sudden, I couldn't stand, so I slumped to the ground and stared ahead and wept. There was a display of pamphlets for some program on a side table between a clipboard and a potted plant. On the pamphlet was a father carrying his son on his shoulders. They were smiling, happy, everything we probably couldn't be. I had held Eddie when he was small and felt nothing but thought vacating awe. He was potential, then. Everything and nothing more. Now I was supposed to love him. I did love him, but I hated him too. And I hated me more. I had done something, or hadn't done something, and now he was broken, and I didn't know how to fix him. And when he looked at me with his impenetrable eyes, I saw potential once more. But I didn't know for what. And I was terrified of that. Lieutenant Namus had a god that he worshipped while staring at the mirror in his tent. His god was just, fearsome, resolute. And his god was his alone. For now. He had offered his god to the first of his two prisoners. It was an act of mercy that had surprised his soldiers, but not half as much as it had surprised Namus himself. His enemy deserved no enlightenment or beneficence, and yet he wondered if there might be more to them than artful meat and blood. Perhaps, he thought, one day they might call him Namus the Wise, Namus the Prophet, Namus the Divine. Disappointingly, his captive, his enemy, had refused his kindness. He had babbled in his insufferable language and prostrated himself in fear for his life. His life. Selfish. Namus was no shepherd of egocentric livestock. He was a leader of artistic and holy men, cutthroats and knights of the field of war. He would not be diminished by a heathen, and his rage had flared so cacophonously that he could not even hear the music of the men's screams. The second captive was more promising. He spoke Namus's tongue. He didn't cower and quail at the sight of his countrymen's blood. He simply knelt and stared. Tell me, boy, do you like music? Namus knew the question was an oblique one but he had no desire for philosophers and second-guessers, and the boy did not disappoint. Yes. Good. And what gods have you? I have no gods. Namus searched the black of the boy's eyes for a lie, but he found nothing. Endless depth. An honest void. Well, he smiled. Would you like one? Come again? I asked if you'd like one, Dad. 
The cookies. Eddie held out a plate of cookies, awkwardly perched on his cast and steadied by his uninjured hand. There were four of them, store-bought snickerdoodles arranged in a tiny square. Each was topped with a slouching dollop of whipped cream and a few green sprinkles we must have gotten for St. Patrick's Day. They were almost cute, and a small part of me was frightened to eat them. He smiled like he did in public, his smile he saved for others. He'd been like this since the last meeting with Dr. Foster. Pleasant at home, polite, deferential, odd. Dr. Foster had expressed plain misgivings about me, but said that in the end, Eddie had been insistent that I hadn't hurt him. I had plenty of misgivings about Dr. Foster, too. He could be an absolute prick without trying, smug in a quietly academic sort of way. But maybe he'd done something good. Or maybe Eddie had done something bad, and he was pretending at contrition. What might be worse than nearly killing a stranger? I eyed the cookie suspiciously and felt crazy for it. Sure, buddy. Thanks. I managed to smile as I took one. You're welcome, Dad. Cooper was quietly observing a mobile that hung over his playmats on the living room floor, bright-eyed and seemingly thoughtful at each rattle or jingle that the dangling clouds and birds and hot air balloons produced. He babbled occasionally, growling like a hatching dinosaur might, cooed sweetly. With all of Eddie's difficulties, I'd lost time with a son of mine who didn't make me wince. It wasn't fair. I resented Eddie for that. But now he was being good, and my resentment didn't seem fair to him. Mommy, Cookie, I tried to make them as pretty as you. Saccharin. Rachel took one without my measurement of distrust. Thank you, sweetie. They are pretty. Her tone was tired, lilting thinly as she gave him an equally thin smile. Is it okay if Namus has one too, Mommy? Whatever you like. Namus sat on the sofa in the living room, spotted and vaguely cute. Of all Eddie's toys, he seemed to like Namus best. He kept track of him as others got misplaced. One would almost think that he loved him. Once or twice, I had wondered if nine years old was too old for a stuffed animal. I couldn't remember what I had played with at his age. Action figures, maybe. Video games. Eddie made pillow forts on his bed and played with stuffies and spoke in a made-up language that he never translated for us. And as I thought about it, I realized that it all seemed normal. Eddie was a child. Maybe my judgment was the problem. Eddie talked to Namus in an indecipherable patter. He ate Namus's cookie for him, spilled crumbs on the sofa. There was a time when I would have chastised him for that. But now, I was a hostage of a good mood and a remarkably peaceful home, so I said nothing. Sitting at the dining table in the next room, Rachel wrote feverishly in her latest journal. Dr. Foster gave them out like prescription medication. Pocket-sized blue books with ruled pages and a little red string bookmark attached to the spine. Rachel had filled three since we'd started therapy. Eddie hid his journal and shared it only with Dr. Foster in their one-on-one -on -one segments of our group sessions. I hadn't had the heart to write much of what I felt. After our cookies, we went to bed. Eddie didn't fight us. He didn't shout and claw and wake up his brother. He told Rachel and I that he loved us, and I watched those foreign words level the armature of Rachel's dismay. She hadn't cried all day, and before waking around midnight, I think I'd been having a pleasant dream. I awoke in ordinary darkness beside my wife and the familiar rectangle of Cooper's bassinet that stood on her side of the bed. Her steady breath and Cooper's said they both were sleeping soundly. The streetlight outside our window cast a dim shape across our bed, fractured by the shadow of a bare-limbed maple tree. I felt warm between our flannel sheets, comfortable, and beneath the plush weight of our duvet and yet I shivered all the same. I had never dealt with proper anxiety. I took no regular medication, 
I didn't spiral like Rachel sometimes did, but I wondered if my mind wasn't succumbing to the frailty I felt in my nerves. Unhelpful. I closed my eyes again, tried to drift, rolled onto my back, my side, my back again. Sleep wouldn't come, so I went to my Kindle and tried to read myself into fatigue. An hour passed before the dull backlight and tiny prints began to burn my eyes. I was rereading paragraphs unintentionally. Tired but not sleepy, I lay the ebook on my chest and stared into the dark. I thought about journaling. I'd have to do it downstairs, but maybe it would do something about the prickling in my skin. I'd need a hoodie, slippers. The armoire toward the foot of the bed seemed painfully far away. Maybe I could write in the dark. My eyes were adjusting away from the light of my screen. It's not like my handwriting needed to look. My mind paused. I squinted. At the space beside the armoire. At a shape that didn't belong. At... Eddie? I whispered. Quiet. Not as quiet as Eddie, who stood completely still staring at me from the corner in the dark. Our bedroom door had been closed since I woke. He hadn't moved an inch, and I shivered once again. Eddie, why are you... I lifted my Kindle and cast him in its anemic light. He cradled Namus in the bend of his cast. His other arm dangled at his side as I leaned forward. Something glinted in his hand. What are you holding, buddy? He took a step towards me, silent. Buddy, I found it on the floor where Mommy wasn't eating her cookie. He whispered, took another step. What is it, Eddie? A piece of Mommy's wine glass, Paul. The one that broke. Eddie, I wanted to give it to you. So that no one gets hurt. Okay, Eddie. Good. But you don't want to get hurt either, right? So, just put it... He set the shard of glass on the foot of the bed and took another two steps along my side of it. I tried to exhale normally, but my breath shuddered out in spite of my effort. Did you know you can make music with glass, Daddy? What? If you move a wet finger around the top... Eddie, I don't... Do you like music, Daddy? What do you mean? Eddie smiled and clutched Namus to his chest. You and Mommy sleep so soundly, Daddy. You're all so tired. I wish I could sleep as well as you. His gaze turned to Rachel and he sighed. Good night, Daddy. Sweet dreams. He left without saying another word. And I didn't sleep a wink. He never tired of hearing the music of pain. Lieutenant Namus had taken to closing his eyes to better appreciate the nuance. The shallow breaths like woodwinds playing pianissimo. The clack of teeth. Subtle percussion. The symphonic crescendo of a guttural scream rising from the lungs like the irreplaceable aria of a well-tuned violin. The boy, his first disciple, was a prodigy. Bravo, boy. Namus didn't mind being effusive when it was well warranted. The boy was humble enough that cautious praise was unnecessary. He knew his place. Namus knew his potential, but the war would not turn on potential alone. Namus's war was now a holy one, ordained by a god who hungered for aesthetic perfection. And if the boy's raw talons demonstrated their god's blessing, then Namus would make an idol of the boy. A zealot. A crusader. It was not something his other soldiers truly understood. Those with the stomachs for art worked like craftsmen. They were useful, certainly, but they lacked creativity. The boy made transcendence, synthesia woven from the medium of suffering, a nocturne in the vagrant hues of coagulation, impressionist whimsy in the cartilaginous pop of a hyperextended knee. 
Namus might have been envious, were he not so proud. If only he could simply feel that pride, without the bore of tactics and strategy. But the enemy vexed him as ever. Devils, all in the space beyond the pillows and blankets that were his home, his consecrated ground, his holy land. Pilgrim's Medical Center had treated both Eddie and the girl in the yellow dress, Tansy. They had traveled in separate ambulances. Tansy was unconscious, her lips had been slightly blue, so she went first. Eddie had wailed and moaned. I'm sure it hurt like hell, but as we traveled with him, all I could think of was the look on his face before he dropped. Now, Eddie was in a cast he found irksome, but he was fine. His arm would heal, Rachel and I knew that, though we avoided talking about any of that day on the playground as we sat in the hall outside Dr. Foster's office. Rachel wanted to believe that her son would make her cry, but wouldn't make a child bleed. She'd kept in touch with Tansley's parents, sent them flowers, lied to herself, and I stayed silent. Rachel sighed as I stared once more at Dr. Foster's pamphlet and its portrait of forced familial bliss. What do you think they talk about? I clicked my tongue. Us. Did we fail? Like, are we bad parents? No. We raised our angel who makes cookies and screams. Paul, I'm serious. I don't know. Bad parents. Maybe. I'm sure Headmaster Foster will let us know. Rachel giggled. Ravenclaw cannot lose any more points, so if I have to, I'm throwing you under the bus. For my house. And what am I then? Slytherin? Hufflepuff, clearly. Hufflepuff? You mean bitch? Classic Huff, badgering people. I laughed at Huff and missed the pun. She just laughed, and for a moment we were younger. A couple with a baby sleeping in a stroller. Happy. Huff. If you're making slick names for Hufflepuff, you're clearly one of them. No. Headmaster Foster gave me a personality test last- uh, Hang on. Text. She pulled out her phone. I kept up the bit. Evasive. Clever. Maybe you are a- Wait. What's wrong? Her brow furrowed. Tears crowded her eyes a moment later. Rachel. What? There was a complication last night. A... a clot. Tansy, the little girl from the playground. She... Fuck. Rachel wept, and I stared ahead, and a few minutes later... The session concluded. Eddie emerged, holding Namus in his arms, smiling like an angel, with blood upon its wings. There is the end of life. There is the beginning of dead. In the middle, there is Namus. There is me and music. We didn't want him to hear, so we told him to play his music loud. It seemed sickening. His bounding children's songs would be ruins afterwards, forever linked with the memory of a dead little girl, and a plastic hospital bag, and a blue hoodie with a cut left sleeve, and the contents of a pocket. Paul, what does it mean? I don't know. Why did he have these? I didn't want to answer Rachel. I couldn't. Not yet. She grimaced. They cut the hoodie off of him at the hospital and put it in the bag, which means he had them at the playground? Yeah. Well, maybe it's not something bad, right? It's not necessarily something bad. Maybe someone at school, or maybe he found them... Why would he keep them, though? She paused and nervously chewed a nail. Any thoughts, Paul? Because if I'm being crazy, I need you to tell me. 
My hand shook. I swallowed. I... I think it was hers. Her? Oh, fuck. Tansy. Why, what? Rachel had opened the hospital bag. She said that she just felt like she needed to. I finally told her about the night I found Eddie standing in the corner of our room. I hadn't wanted to. I didn't want her to fear our son as I did, but I suppose I felt like I needed to. Our son wasn't normal. He had killed a little girl, and I told Rachel the rest. Before that, Tansy had been crying, and before that, standing next to the castle where Eddie had smirked from a narrow window. I wasn't watching him closely enough, but I'd watched Rachel, sullen, pulling Eddie's hoodie from the bag. Then, Rachel, confused, pulling a little pair of pink underwear from the pocket. Now, she stared at those underwear on the verge of tears. Paul, what did our little boy do? I couldn't answer her with certainty. I hadn't seen. No one had. And no one knew the truth except for the one who'd gotten away with it all. They treated him like a victim. And I'd let them. Because he was my son. I don't think he'll get better, Rachel. I think he'll get worse. She wept, and Cooper napped in his bassinet, and the muffled sound of music filled the hall as I went downstairs to the kitchen for a drink. He grew thirsty, hungry, but never tired as he built their church of bones. It was their god's wish that the boy should do the work alone. Lieutenant Namus was merely the engineer. Their god would be pleased. He would reward their sacrifice with peace, an end to the war that had consumed everything, including the reason for its existence. Its beginnings seemed so distant now. Its first blood faded into obscurity upon the field of cloth where so many had since bled and died. But the past was unimportant. Namus knew that. He repeated it to himself like a prayer. The soldiers he had commanded had been his brothers once, but the past was unimportant. They had fought for an ideal once, but the past was unimportant. They had skirmished and rooted and retreated and rallied to keep each other safe once, but the past was unimportant. They had been alive once, but the past was unimportant. Now the boys stacked their bones in artful ranks and files, and built a future atop a foundation of death. Namus had run out of enemies some time before. The last vestiges of their populace scattered and hidden, shaking the air in fear just enough for a musician to find their whispering notes. In his constant practice, the boy had become a crimson virtuoso, but he had played every song the enemy had to offer, so he sought his music elsewhere. Namus's men had screamed, too. Their music resonated with the psychology of betrayal, pure notes that left Namus absolutely breathless. The silence that followed was a kind of music of its own, a final rest awaiting the applause of their patient god. It wouldn't be long now, the church was high and pale, sturdy and beautiful. Inside, the boy would build an altar, and their god would give them one last song. It's nearly done, Lieutenant Namus. You have done wonderful work, Eddie, my boy. Eddie had done terrible things, in the light of day, surrounded by people. He hadn't looked hesitant or concerned, he looked at ease. He had a facility for manipulation beyond his age, a comfort with cruelty. But he didn't kill animals, he didn't set fires, he didn't wet the bed, and we hadn't neglected him. Had we? I browsed warning signs of psychopathy in children on my phone as I sat alone in our kitchen with a bottle of bourbon that hadn't wanted a glass. He'd gotten sympathy from the parents of a girl he murdered. He tricked a fucking psychiatrist. What if he had killed animals and set fires? What if he just hadn't gotten caught? What if he'd looked at ease that day, 
Because Tansy wasn't the... No. No. I took a pull from the bottle, tried to focus on the burn. My thumbs opened a new search on my phone, typed, Missing children near. No. He was my boy. He couldn't be. Fuck. Another swig of whiskey, long and stupefying. I set the phone down and stared at the bottle. Then at the kitchen knives I sometimes counted out of fear. They were all there. They always were. And Eddie had been so good recently. Share a swig. Rachel slumped onto my shoulder and reached for the bottle before I could answer. Sure. This is the third time Baby Shark has played. He's too old for this song. Why does he like it? I don't know. She settled in the stool beside me and melted onto the island's countertop. I'm a bad mom, Paul. Fuck. There were so many things I wanted to do as a mom. The good things. But now... You're not a bad mom. Our fourth grader scares the shit out of me. A child I raised. Fuck, honey, he killed a girl. Took her from a mother who was probably so much better than me. So much more patient and attentive and nice. How does that not make me bad? She wore her tears like makeup as she spoke. Present, but barely noticeable. I didn't want this. You love him. I don't know if I do. I used to love him. When he was sweet and he needed me. And for the past couple weeks, he's been good. And every now and then I think I love him. But then I see his eyes. And I realize that all I love is the peace of this fucking act. She paused and drank a finger from the bottle. When I see his eyes, I don't feel love. I feel dread. Because I know that the act will end. So, what do we do? What can we do? Everyone, that Dr. Foster included, thinks that he's normal. Dr. Foster? She sighed. I've spent the past ten minutes with his little journal, writing my feelings. Horrible, fucking, angry things about Eddie. And I don't feel better. I feel like a bad mom. But maybe I'll be tipsy enough in a few to forget that. I didn't want this. I wanted her to be okay. I love you, Rach. You too. The music rose as she left me alone in the kitchen. Eddie had opened his door. Perhaps he would come downstairs and tell me how beautifully I drank with a big plastic smile and his dull black eyes. It will be best to earn the compliment, right? I gulped miserably, swallowed, and the whiskey washed away my cynicism for a moment. I didn't want to resent his kindness. I had agreed to take him to therapy, and he had managed to tell Dr. Foster the truth after suggesting that I had hurt him. Was that remorse? Whatever the reason, he had changed afterwards. It might have been an act, but... I acted happy sometimes until I actually was. If he could change, if he could learn to be good, then this is what it would look like, I suppose. Eddie smiling. Eddie being... Paul? Rachel didn't yell my name. She shrieked it. Help me. I ran up the stairs, imagining horrible things, stumbling, sobered by adrenaline as my body lags behind. Rachel! I passed Eddie in the hall. Smirking. Hands bloody. What did you- Paul, please! I pushed past him into my bedroom. Something crunched underfoot as I entered. Rachel was screaming, crying, covered in blood, standing on her side of the bed, looking down into the bassinet. Paul, call 911. Oh, God, what did he do? I dialed. Cooper, wake up, baby, wake up. Please, fucking wake up. Uh, hello? Yes, this is an emergency. Fuck. Um, my son's been stabbed. There's a lot of blood. And, and he's... He's one and a half. And, and no, he's he's not conscious. I'm so sorry, baby. Please just be okay. Please, just... Yeah, that's right. Fernhill Lake. Fuck. 
<laughs> Fuck, honey. She says to apply pressure to the wound. Just be okay. Just be okay. Rachel, pressure. Which wounds? Jesus fucking Christ. My poor little guy. Just be okay. Please. Yes, still in the house. It's my... Rachel, I'm gonna lock the bedroom door, okay? I'm still here. What do I do, Paul? There's too much blood. Paul, what do I do? They're on their way, honey. Hurry, please, please, just fucking... What do I do, Paul? Baby, just be okay. Just wake up. Wake up. Wake up, Cooper, please. It's mommy. Please. What do I fucking do? Paul, tell me what to do. Please. What do I do? There was nothing to do. Our baby was dead. Eddie had cut Cooper's neck and left a shard of wine glass in Cooper's belly. He'd scattered others across the floor. He must have pulled them from the trash and waited. And as Rachel wept, cradling the limp body of our boy, Baby Shark screamed from the hall, and Eddie thumped against the bedroom door. I feared what I would do if I opened it. I would not speak to him. Couldn't. But he stopped and spoke to us. Mommy! Ah, oh, poor cry bitch baby Rachel lost her little lieutenant Namus. Why? Mommy, where? Eddie, shut your fucking mouth! He thumped again, hard enough to rattle the doorknob. Scream, Paul! Where? Make your pretty music for the boy! Stop it, Eddie! Why are you doing this? Rachel sobbed her words, and Eddie thumped. Namus! Lieutenant Namus! Bleeding heart! Poor brother, baby bitch. He sang a song for no one but his patient god of death. The sirens crept up thinly from the din of shouts and thumps and the blood coursing through my temples. The police arrived first. Eddie was quiet by the time I heard them pounding on the front door. When I unlocked our bedroom door, they were already in the hall. One officer had his gun drawn, held low. The other knelt down, consoling Eddie as he whimpered on the floor. And in an instant, I realized that I knew nothing about my child. His hands were clean, washed, free of the blood he'd spilled. And his face, he hadn't been banging on the door. He had been collecting bruises. Step back, sir. Hands away from your waist. The officer with the pistol was young, tight-shouldered. Wary eyes roving. I called you. As firm as I could manage. My son. He's in there. He gestured with his chin at the bedroom, still holding his gun. What had Eddie told him? I nodded, and he pushed past me. His manner faltered as he stepped through the door and saw. Shit. He radioed something just as a pair of EMTs appeared in the hall. I watched them enter our bedroom as I itched to go back in. Are you getting a pulse? Sir, stay in the hall. I want to be with my wife. Ma'am, you have to let them do their job. They're trying to. Sir, stay in the hall. Buckner, could you? Yeah, I got it. Sir, I'm Officer Buckner. What's your name? Paul. I'm still getting nothing with the AED. What? What does that mean? I'm really sorry, ma'am. This is Baker 5. You got anyone in homicide near Fernhill Lane? Two different officers listened to my story before they let me see Rachel. The first, Buckner, didn't hide his disbelief well. The second, a detective, glad-handed and commiserated vacantly. Another stood officiously beside the door as Rachel and I finally talked. They don't believe me, Paul. Our chaperone made no secret of eavesdropping. I didn't feel like talking. I tried not to think of anything, and hugged Rachel, who, like me, now wore different clothes. The clothes we'd had were now in evidence bags. More and more people swarmed our house. Some busy, some bored, some simply occupying space. And I wanted desperately to be somewhere else. Mercifully, the grief over Cooper hadn't fully hit me, and I supposed the phonetic atmosphere and the noise of a dozen different people was good for that, at least. There hadn't been time to grieve, and they weren't treating us like we'd earned it. 
You can go ahead and bag those. Dennis, you mind taking a look at these? The pieces of conversation were all entirely grim and entirely innocuous, but we hadn't done anything. The front door was locked. You checked the back? PC? This and everything else. Yeah. We waited. Together. Rachel staring at the floor as I watched the officer by the door thumbing at his phone screen. They'd taken Cooper. Rachel didn't want to let him go, but Eddie we hadn't seen. We hadn't heard him, either. I didn't ask about him as the detective entered and whispered to the officer on the ground. Miss George, could you go ahead and stand up for me? Mr. George, you can stay seated. What's happening? Rachel, you don't have to. Turn around and put your palms together behind your back, ma'am. The detective stood lazily in the door frame. He was holding a plastic bag in his hand. I recognized Rachel's little journal inside. She was crying as the door officer read Miranda rights from a card he'd had in his shirt pocket. And I remembered what Rachel had told me in the kitchen. Fuck. She'd been writing horrible things about Eddie. He was covered in bruises and our baby was dead. And she was the only one covered in blood. Detective, listen to me. Eddie is not what he seems. He is a fucking psychopath. He killed our boy, and he killed Tansy Whitman. Sir, you need to calm down. I saw the Marana officer's hands move towards his belt. He's fucking set this up. I'm telling you, he's a conniving little... Nine-year-old. This was all insane. A nightmare. And he was still their victim. Because I'd said nothing when it mattered. Because he was my son. You look poorly, Paul. Have you been sleeping? Not well, Doc. My wife's in prison, my son's dead, and Eddie's a serial killer. You've been drinking. Fucking hell. They teach you everything at Oxford, don't they? Paul, I understand you're going through a traumatic event, that this is all very difficult on you and Eddie. That there is no me and Eddie. My only son is dead. And when CPS finishes their investigation, or whatever, I don't want the other one back. Now, Paul, this is... Now, I don't care. I just want your notes from Eddie's session. You must have said something, done something. And right now, my wife needs that. Dr. Foster sighed, eased his posture into a patronizing, silent no. He was like everyone else. Dismissive of the crazy notion that a child could kill. But I'd been reading. I had nothing but time between my conversations with liquor bottles. Eddie wasn't the youngest killer out there. He was just more controlled than the others. He lied better, fit in better. But perhaps with Dr. Foster, he had been more candid. Less guarded with a man who he knew would keep his secrets. Did he tell you something, Doc? I tried to read him, my eyes full of bleary, trackless scorn against him, piteous and measured. Huh? Some little fucked confession? Something? Paul, I cannot comment on my conversations with Eddie or any of my patients. You know that. But it might help you to talk about your other son, Cooper. I would not cry in front of this man. Fuck that. Untended grief can be a cancer, Paul. Eddie is a cancer. And you, you were supposed to fucking diagnose him. But you fucking failed. And now my son's blood is on your hands too. Another sigh to match my untethered rage. Prick. Perhaps if you journaled your true feelings, it might. Your journals put my wife in a cell. What about Eddie's journal? I didn't find it. He hides it. Why would he do that? Why? What do you fucking know? He had a pack of fresh journals on his desk. Another in front of him along his tidy collection of pompous little trinkets. I'd brought mine with me out of habit. It was almost empty. And a moment later, I pulled it out and tossed it onto the desk. You wanna read mine, Doc? Maybe you can see how I feel. We can have a heart to heart, grab a beer, and you can tell me how it's not so fucking bad. He sat, motionless. I wanted him to cower, to feel my anger, 
I had felt like pummeling him so many times just because I didn't like him. Now, I might have hated him. I hated Eddie. I hated myself. I needed Rachel. I missed my son. He'll kill again. You know that, right? Paul, why do you think it is that you are the only one who demonizes your son? What? You talk about his behavior issues, but does anyone else see them? His teachers, his friends' parents, anyone? He's good at hiding it. He's a pathological liar, an actor. How has he been recently? Nice. Fake. You see that as a ruse, but it was only after we began to discuss abuse, only after confronting that subject, that Eddie changed. What the fuck was he getting at? I wasn't the problem. You love your wife, Paul? Yes. It can be difficult to reconcile a love of someone with the things they do, particularly when their actions seem unthinkable. Perception can sometimes find a path of least resistance to separate that love from the reality we observe. No. Eddie was the monster. Rachel never touched him. She would never hurt her children. Paul, the reason we have therapists isn't solely expertise. We are remarkably poor at viewing ourselves objectively. Stop. I really wanted to address this issue more organically than this. Delusional thought processes... Uh, delusional thought processes are such a fragile... Shut your fucking mouth! I was standing, but I hadn't remembered rising to my feet. My fists clenched, fingernails stinging my palms as my hands vibrated. And all I could think of was Rachel in her navy blue jumpsuit and her orange plastic sandals staring at me from across a table that was bolted to the floor. She deserved none of it, and I felt like Dr. Foster deserved a broken face, but I didn't hit him. I snatched my stupid fucking journal off of his desk, and I seethed. Fuck you, doctor. I won't be back. He stared as I left. I slammed the door and swept his happy pamphlets onto the ground. Crybaby mommy. Quiet daddy forever. Soft like pillows full of feathers. Pick them one by one. Cry, cry, cry. Alone, I felt everything that anger tends to hide. Our house was quiet, Rachel's wind chimes outside, the hiss of a toilet I'd meant to fix, the scrape of a bottle against the coffee table. For so long, quiet is all I'd wanted, but not like this. The house still had the imprint of a crime scene investigation. Books and papers askew, a set of muddy footprints across the carpet. I hadn't been back upstairs except to look for Eddie's journal. He'd taken down the pillow fort on his bed, stripped off the sheets, and shredded each one of his stuffed animals. He'd piled fur and fluff on the center of his mattress, and however many people had gone into his room on the day Cooper died, not one had thought the scene strange enough to second-guess Eddie's traumatized little act. I'd been sleeping on the sofa. My work told me to take time. They understood. Hollow words. Fake, like Eddie. And Cooper. I just felt empty when I thought of him. I missed his smallness, the way he looked around, wondrous and happy. He died before he could walk. He'd never held my hands to steady his little steps. He would never beg me to chase him around the playground. Eddie took all of that. Rachel had lost that, and Eddie took her too. But me? He laughed. He could have told them that I had hit him, but he didn't. I'm convinced that he left me, because he knew that my solitude would be cruelest. I didn't feel like drinking anymore. I was too drunk already, and it didn't help except to pass out and wake miserably just to do it all again. In spite of my feeling about Dr. Foster, my mocking little journal felt like something to try, if only to fill the time. 
So I searched the mess that my drunken grief had made and found the little blue book between the sofa cushions. It opened at its little red bookmark as I set it down, and I saw a page full of writing. It wasn't my journal. It was Eddie's. I had missed it. How? No. Unimportant. It was Eddie's sloppy child's scrawl I saw, and I could finally read the thoughts he'd tried to hide. The journal started with a war. It ended with... He dressed the walls with flesh and clotted blood, carpeted the floor with entrails, bound the bones as beams with sinew and lengths of silky hair. The church's facade he'd left bare, skeletal white tapering to a pointed spire. Amidst the bloody blankets, it looked almost like a tooth. Namus gazed upon it with awe. He had known beauty of all sorts. He had seen it in the red carnage of war. He had heard it in the screams of his godless captives. But he had never known its perfection until now. Namus the Divine, Eddie the Blessed, brothers who had beckoned their holy parentage through rites of savagery and devotion, loveliness and pain. Their work was at an end. Eddie laid the final piece of the altar as Namus watched. He'd chosen skulls and ribs and finger bones, a many-faced idol with curving wings that once held hearts and lovers' hands. Namus didn't need to understand it all to know its worth. He knew the important parts. The altar would bring a sacrifice. The sacrifice would end the war. Their peace would please their god. When it was finished, Eddie rested, and Namus waited, and waited, and waited. Where was their sacrifice? He wondered. Their god. Both are already here, Eddie answered. But Namus hadn't spoken his thoughts aloud. No thought is as quiet as death, Lieutenant Namus. Death hears all. The beat of your heart, the flow of your veins, the tick of the time you have left. But they were brothers. Death stood beside the firstborn of this world, waiting, patient. What brother could death have when none were born outside his gaze? Namus thought he understood. The god he awaited was death. And death was Eddie, and Namus was. Both are already here, Eddie repeated, God and sacrifice, Eddie and Namus. And then Namus saw the church wasn't a church, it was a tomb. Yes, but what of the war, Eddie? Namus asked aloud, how does it end? The war remains unwon till only one remains. Solemnly, Namus nodded. There was no more soldiers left to fight the war but he. His death would bring an everlasting peace. He understood that, but he was frightened. Will there be pain? There will be an end, Eddie answered, and everything that came before will fade. Namus knew what his faith demanded. He knelt before the altar, before Eddie, his first disciple, his last companion. And as those blessed hands began their final work of artistry, he sang a song for no one but his patient god of... Paul, the voice scared the absolute shit out of me. What? What the fuck are you doing in my house? My words slurred as I peeled myself off of the sofa. It took me a moment to get my bearings. I've been knocking, Paul. You didn't answer, so I tried the door. It was unlocked. Dr. Foster stood, hands clasped behind his back, patient, prickish concern across his face. He looked fastidious as ever in his camel coat and pressed blue trousers. 
and I knew I looked like shit without needing the comparison. I must have passed out again. I had been drinking. Reading something. Eddie's journal. Where is it? Where is what? The journal. Uh, Namus and Eddie, uh, the god of death and, and the war. It was right. I found it on the floor. Here. God of death. And Kretchos. Paul. He must have told you, Doc. You're so fucking professional, keeping secrets that killed my... I opened the book. A folded bundle of pages fell from between the blank ones and back onto the floor. My writing filled half of a page with half of a thought. It was my journal. But where was... By midwinter, the war was already lost. The soldiers mustered rank and file. Paul, is this your war? Lieutenant Namus and Captain Casco. He held the creased pages in his hands. That is Eddie's story, not mine. He looked at the pages for a moment more, and then handed them back to me. They were typed, but they couldn't be. I had seen Eddie's writing. I had... Paul, Eddie is a bright boy, but he's nine years old. Look at the writing. It's beyond his skill. No, he was wrong. Eddie, he... He tricked me. The police. He tricked you, too. About the arm, the girl, Tansy. He's not what he seems, Doc. I will concede that Eddie's behavior in our sessions seems a touch forced. Yes. But he knows that you are taking him to me because there's a problem. And it's not unusual for difficult children to be less so in the presence of an outsider. Our relationships are very different things to him. No. Why did they always fucking take his side? He was a murderer. He killed my son. I'd seen. I'd seen him walking away with blood on his hands. But that was enough. Rachel wouldn't hurt Cooper. She wouldn't. His death had destroyed her. And she... If I had her with me, I could confirm the worst parts. If I had her with me, I could feel normal. Insane. I slumped back onto the sofa. I wanted her. I didn't want Dr. Foster. Why was he here? Why are you here, Doc? Why did you come? You're alone, and your family is broken, and believe it or not, Paul, I care about your outcome. He glanced at the bottle on the table. He wasn't subtle. Water might be a good place to start. I'll get you a glass. I murmured my acceptance as he left for the back of our house. I wasn't okay. I knew that. But I didn't see how okay was going to happen for me. Either my son was a murderer, or I was crazy, and my wife was. I unfolded the pages and read again. I barely knew the story. How the fuck could it be mine? Captain Casco? The... Lieutenant? Dr. Foster had pronounced it like a Brit. In the day that Cooper died, as we hid in our room and Eddie pounded on the door, Eddie had pronounced it that way too. Lieutenant, name us. He'd screamed it through the door, and I thought nothing of it, because I was trying not to think at all. I stared blankly at the first page of the story, read idly as I paused the coincidence. Captain Costco had fallen three nights prior, but the fighting hadn't ebbed long enough for official change in command. If Namus had stopped for his moment of self-congratulatory pomp, it would have been for his honor alone. Honor. Like a Brit. I hadn't written it. Dr. Foster had. And Eddie. Eddie must have copied it down. Lieutenant. Eddie couldn't have read a pronunciation on a page. Had Dr. Foster read it to him? A story about the beauty of violence and a boy named Eddie who became a god of death. Where was Foster? Doc? He didn't answer. I stood and stumbled toward the kitchen. Dr. Foster? He wasn't there. The glass of water was. Sitting next to the sink. Where would he have gone? The back door was locked. 
Perhaps the bathroom. The pantry. My eyes roved toward the bathroom door first, rushed over the kitchen island, followed a habit, counted the knives. One too few. Fuck. Paul. I spun around at the sound of his voice and the creak of the pantry door. I saw the metal in his hand. He stepped, I reached, reached for his hand, missed and grabbed the blade as he lurched toward me. I expected pain, something sharp. I winced reflexively, but as my hand squeezed, I felt a handle. Dr. Foster had been holding the blade, and his blood now coated it as I pulled back the knife. Paul, you... He stumbled back, reached in his pocket for his phone. But... No. Hello. I need help. I've been stabbed by a patient. He was holding the blade. He wrote the story. He... Fernhill Lane. His name is Paul George. Not me. I didn't do anything wrong. He planned it. Made me stab him. Each truthful word I thought to say echoed like a lie. They wouldn't believe me. I knew that. And they didn't. And they still don't. The doctors at Clinton Mental Health Correction Center, the orderlies, the patients, none of them believe a word of it. But I know the truth now. Eddie is a psychopath. He's just good at hiding it, because session after session, he sat in a side room of an office and learned to lie from a man just like him. A psychiatrist who recognized his reflection in Eddie's eyes, and then groomed him to kill. I know that's right. It's the simplest explanation. Dr. Foster was the one who convinced them to let me keep the story of Lieutenant Namus and the boy complete with Eddie's psychotic ramblings in the margins. He said it would help me distinguish between the written fantasy and reality. Prick. He took my son, my wife, our freedom, everything, and he left me with time and the flaking walls of a loony bin. And he left me a story, because it was always about him. Namus, who taught a boy how to kill. Namus, whose task was only ever to destroy. Well, now I write to remember as much as I can about the truth. I posted it here, hoping that someone would believe me. Rachel believes me. She tells me during our phone calls, and I tell her that I still love her, that I need her like she needs me. But I don't tell her about the fear. I don't tell her about the visits. I keep quiet about my Saturdays, when in the afternoons, I look out the window and see them standing in the shade of a maple tree, looking back at me, smiling. Foster and Eddie. Namus and his patient guard of death.